Ronald Brown came this morning, and not only was the house full, y'all even had a good spirit. And I just want to compliment you and say thank you. You could not give me a better gift than to show up with the praise on your lips. I don't seek after the affirmation of men. It's nice but I don't seek after it. But who doesn't want those in authority over you not to have a good opinion of you? And Brother Brown talked to me at lunch a little bit. He said, you know, that's the Canadian in me, you know. Brother Sadler, please keep pitching ideas because we think we've got a great future in our district. And you don't hear me talk a lot about the district, but... People in Knoxville need the Holy Ghost just as much as people in Nashville need the Holy Ghost. And that we can go to bed at night as long as my four and no more are saved, we, we need to change that. We, if my brother and sister are losing sleep because of lost children, we need to lose a little sleep. Is that okay? I, I, I just feel it very strong tonight. Brother and Sister Brown don't have a legends in the area and they wanted to go there today and we waited the 45 minutes if you've been around me very long brother artman you know i don't like to wait a long time to eat lunch the older i get the less i like to wait Jew and i've almost gotten to the place that we'll go through arby's and take it home but today we went to the legends there in the other side of smyrna and the lobby was full, and there really wasn't a whole lot of place for me to sit. I was preferring those others to have a seat. And a little slither of space open next to Julie. And I wanted to sit next to her. And there was a lady that had given a little smidge. She saw me come, and I think she knew we were together. And she scooched over towards her husband real close. And said, come and sit down here. And I said, thank you so much for letting me sit next to my sweetie. I want you to know that I never meet a stranger, Brother Hodge. I said, y'all having a good day, and it was on. And, and she said, what church do y'all go to? And I said, well, the, we have a church over behind the tractor supply and the plaza center. Oh, really? What denomination? I said, Pentecostal. Is that like Church of God? It's a lot like Church of God. And she she opened up and I said, you know, we started 18 years ago, so on and so forth. And the conversation turned just a bit. And I said, you know, my wife and I are originally from Huntsville. Really? I was born and raised in Decatur. Up until just a couple of years ago, we lived in Madison, Julie's hometown, a little community within the city limits of Huntsville. And before we left sitting together, she said, do you have a business card? And I said, that's like saying, Scooby to a hog. Wait on you. I pull, on faith, I pulled my wallet out. Sister Caban, she saw all my receipts. I said, don't worry. Tomorrow's judgment day, Sister Caban will get all these receipts out of my wallet. We'll reconcile it. Tomorrow's judgment day. She laughed. She took my card. She said, thank you. She went her way with her husband. I talked to her husband for a minute. He works at Nissan. Talked to them just a minute. They went and sat down. Because our group was a little larger, it was a while before we got to order and got our food. And I want you to know that lady, barely knew her, came and humbled down at the end of the table and said, I want you to pray for my son who is 17. He's got some issues and he's on some medicine. And it's made him angry. He's even said, I thought about taking my own life. She said, would your church pray? Can I tell you, the kingdom of God is bigger than your four. God has got souls that are just ripe for the harvest. If us laborers would get focused on the harvest. I'm not trying to dun you tonight. I'm just trying to tell you there was a time period that we believed the lie of Satan that nobody wants this gospel. The reason they don't want it is because they don't know the power of this gospel. If they had their revelation that God with the swoop of his finger could take away years of guilt and shame, that God could put families back together, that God could crush addictions that dictate our daily existence. If they only knew the gospel as we know the gospel. If you have your Bibles tonight, John's Gospel chapter 6. Don't stand, Brother Caleb, it's too much. 
Some of y'all be wilted. Excuse me, I don't have a hanky tonight. Some people run and scream and holler when the Lord moves with them. I cry. Hope that's okay. The Lord usually lays his finger on that part that you're the most proud of not doing. Like, I'm not going to cry. He'll show you. I'm going to cry if I tell you to cry. So I don't run from it. I just accept that the Lord is speaking to me and through me tonight. John's Gospel, chapter 6. Jesus is talking to his disciples. If you were here Wednesday night, we realize there's the multitude. Oftentimes, they're after the loaves and fishes. And then we know there's the 500 that they somewhat aligned, but they were more like attenders, not really members. And there was the 70, and that was the Sanhedrin that came to find fault with him. And there were the 12, those are the ones that he had picked to facilitate the ministry after his death, burial, and resurrection. They were in school. As disciples, they were in school to learn what to do when the master was no longer in their presence on a daily basis. Does that make sense? And he begins to talk to them. Look at verse 47, verily, verily, which means truly, truly, I send you. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. How cool is manna? Okay, let's back up. Anybody here ever have to go to the grocery store on Sunday night? Because you got lunches to pack for the week. Because it don't last forever. And what you don't get eat goes bad. And if we don't get it from Panera or we don't get it given to us from Kroger, we're going to have to go to Kroger and we're going to have to buy some bread. Do you understand that there was the miraculous touch of God that provided bread, manna from heaven for the children of Israel while they were in the wilderness? But the manna that sustained in the moment did not give eternal life for they all died. Even though they were eating the miraculous they still physically died. Can I give you a word tonight? Jesus is saying that I am the bread of life. Take and eat of me and ye shall live forever. Manna is a miracle, but I am a mystery. I am God manifested in flesh. Look at verse 50. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Do you understand they did not understand what Jesus was talking about? There are still people today that try to make what Jesus is saying into something he was not saying. But let me draw your attention. In my Bible, it's in the first verse of the very next page. It says, it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. I want to preach a little bit tonight about our perspective of outreach. Is that okay? Now, I, I was up all night. If, if it was left up to the flesh, I would have stayed home this morning sick. And I asked Brother Brian, did he have something in his Bible? He's always good to have something in his Bible. He's the best understudy you could ever have. He's always got a word. But I felt compelled in my spirit to speak to you on the subject tonight that God wants to change our perspective of outreach. Is that okay? Why don't you lift your hands towards heaven and say, Jesus, tonight. God, it's not about us. It's about you in us. It's not about what we can do. It's what we allow you to do. God, wash our eyes that we can see in the Spirit. God, the salvation of souls. God, that you have put in our path. And God, even this hour, God, give us a fresh touch. God, a fresh passion, a desire. God, to see the world impacted and the kingdom expanded, for it's in Jesus' name. And let everybody say amen. Amen. I wrestled with some of the examples I'm going to give you tonight because I don't want to be 
sensational or hyperbolic, but, but I do want to make my point that in my home church growing up, we had a man that, through an accident, became blind. He could not see. And it was through that experience, he had a great job, he had everything going his way, but he lost his physical vision. And through becoming blind, he came dependent upon others. And he left his job for a year or so. He had to learn Braille, and he had to learn how to function without his physical eyes. And it was in that journey that he had to relearn some things. The only cassette book, his mother, who was giving him his daily lessons in Braille, his wife was working to keep the family going, and his mother watched him. The only book she had, anybody here read, listen to books on cassette or DVD or is it Audible? Randy, that's what you listen to, Audible. My Lord, this guy's going back to school. He's listening to a new book every day. I love it. His passion for history, I love it. The only book she had was the Bible on cassette. Anybody remember Alexander Scorby's translation or the, his narration of the Bible? And he sat in that chair in his mother's dining room. He liked to sit in one chair because the light would come through the window. And Brother Sub, he couldn't see the light, but he could feel the warmth thereof. And God, through the Alexander Scorby narrated scriptures, reached down and touched his heart. See, he had to become blind that he may see. No longer was he confident in what he could do because he became dependent on others. If we're all honest today, we are all dependent upon others. I'm self-sufficient. Except for Neymar Hodge and Tony Stubbs and maybe Randy Church, the rest of y'all going to starve if the truckers quit running. I'm just going to tell you. That's why I got me a cabin over at Neymar's place. I'm going to. Hang out. I can grow a garden. I just don't have time to do it justice. I I love the smell of the soil turn. We're all dependent upon other people. We are experts on how we feel, but oftentimes our feelings get out of bounds and we need a professional to help us to get our emotions back under control. I'm just being real tonight. Is that okay? You know you've got pain in your body, but you don't know what it's going to take to fix it. So you need medical attention or you know some things, but you need somebody to teach you more. Are you getting what I'm saying? We're not self-sufficient. And Robbie had to become blind that he may see. And it was through that experience of the audible word of God. Nobody preached to him. It was just the word of unadulterated word of God penetrated his heart and captivated his mind and changed his attitude and he received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Nobody taught him a Bible study. He wanted to be baptized in Jesus' name because he had heard it from the Word of God. Can I say this? If we'll get our nose in the book, it works. Here's what I want to talk about. But I remember our pastor at the time had a personal burden for Robbie. A personal burden him and every time we had a prayer service and God began to do things he would want to pray for Robbie because he said Lord I I, I just want Robbie to get his eyesight back he's come so far he's done so much God and he's had transformation could you not because his attitude is so good and his desire to serve you he could be bitter through blindness but he's chosen to be better through his circumstance my pastor told me one time He said, I was praying earnestly. He said, I almost felt my skin vibrating. I was so moved on by the Spirit, and I prayed for him. But he said, I couldn't close my eyes because I just believed God was going to open his eyes, and I wanted to see the healing on his face. Now, can I tell you something? If a blind man gets his vision back, that's going to create a buzz. You won't need Facebook. We're thankful for the resource. We don't need Facebook. The Bible tells us there was a blind man. Brother Brown referenced several of my references for tonight. There was a blind man, and they tried to find fault with what Jesus did. He said, all I know is I was blind, but now I see. You got to go because you're an offense to me that this man who eats with 
publicans and sinners and don't wash his hands and don't observe the things we think he should observe. He's not worthy. Guys, it ain't based on what men's expectations. Was he obeying the expectations of his heavenly father? I say yes. Even Nicodemus says, except God be with him, how could you do the things that you do? Now, here's where it gets personal. My pastor had a Robbie. Mine was Vicki Brown. I earnestly desire, not for my sake, but that souls could see that our God can heal. And I just begin to press the Lord. You could come by my office to see the tears on my cheeks, and I would seek the Lord and read the scriptures and know that it is possible and know that it's in his purview and that he can. God, how many of us prayed earnestly for my sister while she was alive? Who, who here prayed earnestly? Who fasted? Who, who contended? Who continued to stand up boldly in faith, believing even at the 11th hour and 59th minute that God can? He may not choose to, but I know he can. What I'm trying to say tonight the same passion we felt for our sister who was dying in our presence. Weaker by the day, stirred our hearts, gave us a desire to see God work. Why don't we have that same passion for the lost? Verse 63 still says, It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. If we can just get the right outreach program, if we can just get the right director, if we can get the right tools and resources, if we can knock the right door, if we can go on the right date, if we can practice our speaking skills, if we can wear the right clothes, if we can have enough charisma, and I'm telling you there's nothing about us that is able within the power of the flesh to save the lost. How do you know that, Pastor? The Bible says very clearly. Referencing those that are lost, they are deaf. They hear the word of God, but it means nothing to them. They don't understand. They can't get it. What meaneth this? They are blind. For Jesus would say one thing. He said, what? Well, that don't make sense. How can a man, when he is old, enter into his mother's womb a second time? Because he was using physical concepts and did not have spiritual eyes. Let me ask a question. Who's ever heard the Bible say that those are dead in trespasses and sin? Is it in there? So let me ask you a question tonight. I'm being very serious. Almost said dead serious, but I don't think that's good choice of words either what if I said tonight go to the graveyard and just get one person I'm serious what if I said go to the graveyard tonight and just get one person how would that work out I was going for the dark side What do you think your success ratio for evangelism is going to be? In the flesh. Boy, if I, if I wear the right clothes down to the cemetery, that dead person is going to get up and say, Woo! Right? If I said the right words, it's going to wow them so much that life is going to come back in their body. Do you understand why Jeremiah saw the mystery of God unfold in front of him? You understand, there is nothing in us that is able to save people. Pastor, I brought my cousin and you were preaching, they got saved. They didn't get saved because of me. They got saved by the bread. The word of God was preached. The word of God that breaks shackles. The word of God that opens eyes. The word of God that pierces darkness. The weird word of God that breaks the shackle of addiction. It's the word of God. I tried to 
bust a chain. It was a chain on a locking mechanism that had a swivel. And you know what? One crowbar just made me mad. Because I'd shove it in there, and it'd just spin, and spin, and spin, and spin. You ever, know, you ever done that? Spinning in place. You think you're tightening a bolt, and the whole thing's spinning. Who's ever done that? Uh, check it before you cut the water on. I'm, I'm being real for just a second. That one pry bar, trying to move that chain to break it, was just spinning and spinning. But I got a second pry bar, and I began to put it in pushing it the other direction and both forces torqued against each other and it broke that shackle what am I telling you it's not just the word of God for some people the word of God just caused them to go around in circles and... who's ever taught a Bible study you think you're getting someone to say but what does it say in the revelation what does this mean Melchizedek what does this mean about Mary and Nathalie? and are we all giants and are there's lives on Neptune who's had that argument with people I'll never forget, my dad said he taught a Bible study guy for 10 weeks. The guy came to the altar, and he's down there about 10 minutes. And dad said, hey, can I ask what you're praying about? He said, I just want to know, does a nanny goat's horns go forwards or backwards? After the fact, he really didn't want to know what the guy was thinking about while he was praying. He didn't get the Holy Ghost that night either, by the way. I just want you all to know that. Do you realize that some people just with the Word of God go in circles? But when you come into an apostolic worship service, it's the Word of God and it's the Spirit of God. And the Word of God is like a firecracker and the Spirit of God is like a counterbalance. It begins to break the yoke of the things we've been taught that are not in the Bible, that are not true. And God begins to get somewhere with us by His blood and by His flesh, by His Word and by His Spirit. What are you talking about tonight, Pastor? It's like this. If we're going to see somebody healed of cancer, we know it's going to take a miracle. If we're going to see the blinded eyes open, and that's great outreach right there, come on. It's going to take a miracle, isn't it? The deaf able to hear, that's going to take a miracle. And if somebody gets saved, if somebody leaves the world of sin and draws nigh unto God and finds his grace and mercy sufficient to set them free and to save their soul, it's going to take the same fervent auction, prayer. If we think knocking doors scares the devil, we deceive ourselves. We're knocking on the door. And the devil's being streamed inside the house. You on the outside, he's on the inside. I'm just speaking to us tonight that God has a desire to take us to a higher plateau of outreach. Here, here, here's what I'll say. Do you remember when Moses went to the mount? And he just caught a glimpse of the hinder parts of God, his radiant, glorious glow. And just catching a glimpse of his radiance as he, the train of his glory went by made Moses' face shine bright. As a kid, I thought he put that drape on so it wouldn't scare people. I boo. You know, my face is glowing. If I put a drape on, my face so they won't be able to see. No, you, if you read the scriptures closely, he put the drape on after the glow began to wear off. Because he didn't want people to see that he had been in the presence of the Lord in a long time. Can, can I say this? This relates to this church or any movement. Impassioned people who have had a very audible experience with the Lord impact great groups of people. It is the Charles Parms in Topeka, Kansas, that through a prayer meeting of multiple days and nights that the Holy Ghost fell and, and students began to receive the Holy Ghost. Students that could have went home for Christmas break, but they sought after a move of the Holy Ghost in prayer and fasting. And God, God does not meet us at parties, fiestas, 
He don't come to our siestas. It's those that are hunger and thirst after righteousness that are filled. That same exuberance went to Azusa Street in a livery stable in Los Angeles. A, a little uneducated African American man from Louisiana who had heard of the Holy Ghost but had not yet received it had a series of prayer meetings. William Seymour. He preached about the ability to receive the Holy Ghost to lost people, and he himself had not received it yet. He had not received the Holy Ghost, but he had been in the presence of the Lord. I want you to get this for just a second. Do you understand that the miraculous revival, the, the dominant part of that outpouring, lasted over 13 years, continuous, day, 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 Monday, Wednesday, Monday Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, for 13 plus years. But do you realize that like a lot of outpourings, whether it's the great Welsh revivals, or if it's in Topeka, Kansas, or if it's in Bogalusa, Louisiana, or if it's in Houston, Texas, or if it's in Azusa Street in Los Angeles, when that one person who had that intimate connection with God dies, when the founder dies, the movement usually dies. Do you know why that is? Because the followers have no personal connection with the Lord. They're depending upon the founder to give them connection. Last Sunday, I preached to you some of my greatest fears. One of my greatest fears is that some of you think you're saved when you're really lost. My second fear is that some of you feel lost when you're really saved. But another one of my fears is honestly and earnestly this. I don't want your relationship with God to have to come through me for you yourself can come boldly before the throne of grace. You don't need me to go to heavenly places. You can be enveloped in prayer, covered in the name of Jesus. You can utter his name and be swept into his presence. It's not controlled by me. It's dictated by your desire. If you're not going up higher, it's because you haven't desired to go up higher. Pastor, don't have a gate on the fence. God, Pastor's not trying to control your relationship. Pastor's trying to call you to a higher place. It's not our charisma. It's not our people skills that's going to raise the spiritually dead. It's going to be those that they've had outreach on their knees. That same heaviness and desire to see a good sister healed of cancer is the same burden and passion we need to have for some of your children and your grandchildren. It won't be a slideshow or a slick presentation that will see the lost resurrected. It will only be the church that's had a personal relationship with God that can speak with authority. Look what the Lord has done in me. Tony Stubbs doesn't recognize it always. But he is a spiritual leader to his family even those who don't accept his God. You know how I know that? When they need something spiritual, who they call? He represents a God. His God delivered him from addiction. His God saved him from himself. His God sobered him up. His God gave him a, a better quality of life. God is no respecter of persons if he'll do it for Tony. But when was the last time we went out reaching for souls on our knees, travailing to God, wanting to see him move for somebody's salvation? Where we couldn't eat, we couldn't sleep. All we could do is weep, cry, and pray. Can I say this? If I see one more preacher think they're spiritual by how many selfies with famous preachers they have made their picture made with, I don't care how many selfies with big name preachers you have made, that don't make you spiritual. 
it ain't who you're running with, it's who you are that dictates. We only have one advocate, only one mediator, only one testator, only one that we can go to. We don't need the Pope. We don't need the bishop. We don't need the cardinal. We don't need the priest. For we have a great high priest. He speaks Filipino fluently. He speaks Spanish fluently. He speaks ghetto fluently. He speaks depression fluently. He hears the diction clearly. I'm telling somebody, we have a high priest that we don't have to run from. We can run to. So why are you staying in the valley when he's calling you up higher? I love what he said about the disciples. The Bible says in one passage in the book of Acts, them disciples was ignorant and unlearned men. Sister Floor, there's hope for me yet. If ignorant and unlearned men can be movers and shakers in the kingdom, there's hope for me. It ain't your degree. It's not your ability. It's your availability. How you yield yourself. To the Lord. Here, here, here's what I want to say. In one passage, it says they noticed that they were ignorant, un unlearned men. And in the same chapter, the same man said, But we can perceive that these have been with Jesus. We don't need another Bible study on how. We don't need a, neither, another self help group and support group. What we need is. To, the world to know that we have been with Jesus. And there's something about our countenance that says that God is able. Here it is, here it is. Does this scream God is able? Excuse me just a second. Does this scream God is able? For this group over here. Does this scream God is able? What screams God is able? Our countenance. The fruit of our lips, our walk, when everybody else is saying it's Blue Monday, Blue Monday, and we whistle zippy to do dah. I'm telling you, can I can I be real for a minute? I love support groups. Do I not believe in celebrate recovery? And, and this is a group that's going to give support and infrastructure to people that need critical, kind, accountable words to continue in the process. Because it ain't going to feel good. The process starts, it don't feel good. Who's ever started physical therapy? You can't wait to get there, right? Oh, I get to go to physical therapy. Yay! That old torture chamber, that old mean physical therapist, they like to made me cry the other day. But you know what? Through the pain, what? The process. You get to where when you couldn't walk, now you can't. Right, Brother Hodge, going through knee rehab. That first day was awful, wasn't it? You weren't thinking kind thoughts, were you? It's the Holy Ghost that kept you smiling, wasn't it? Yeah. I know, I've, I've done it. I've, I've been there. It's no fun. What am I telling you? I'm telling you. That God is not looking for saints that have to have five or six people getting them to come to church every week. That's not born again. God, God's vision for a saint is not a dead body marking that seat. Some people still come to church long after they're dead. How am I doing? Just because you can hold the posture. Maybe the mortician put a prop him up and play a take, right? Somebody has to beg you every Saturday to come to church on Sunday. Pastor has to pat your hand, pat your back, stroke your ego, love on you. You know what? There needs to come a point in our life, but because we've been in the presence of the Lord. It ain't like a black hole. It's like a glorious light. 
we can't break free from. That in the flesh I want to stay home and lay in bed, but the Spirit lifts me out of that bed, takes me down the John Bragg Highway, calls me to bring my pastor a Hardy's biscuit. If you have not, because you ask not. You pass for Hardy's and you don't bring me a biscuit, shame on you. What am I saying? There is something about people who have been in the presence of Jesus. In the presence of Jesus. My brother had the privilege. This won't matter to you at all. This won't matter to you at all. He got to go to an event in Nashville. And it was to honor the legendary banjo player, Earl Scruggs. Scruggs was doing things 50 years ago that banjo artisans are now just able to play. A friend of ours tried to learn to play the banjo. He would have to slow his records down on the slowest speed and play them over and just to be able to hear the licks. And that night, Scruggs was shaking a few hands afterwards, and he handed out a few picks, and my brother got a pick from Earl Scruggs. He told me that story at his house one year at Christmas. You know what my next question was? Can I see it? Can I see it? Earl Scruggs, the fabulous banjo player. Some of y'all don't like bluegrass. There's going to be remedial classes in heaven for you. So you'll get up to speed with God's music. Tiffany, it's real. It's powerful. It's powerful. And, and, and I sit there, and really my brother's encounter with Scruggs was, hey, I enjoy your music. Thank you for all that you do. He shook his hand, and Mr. Scruggs gave him a, a I believe, a index finger pick for playing the banjo. That's, that's the way I remember it. And I said, Randy, what was he like? Oh, man. And he only said two words to him. Oh, he was the nicest guy. In, oh, I always envisioned him being a nice guy. I said, can I see the pick? Oh, here's the pick. Oh, he's got pretty small fingers. And I began to say, imagine all the personality traits and mannerisms of a man that said two words to my brother. Are you getting what I'm saying? But just because he had been in his presence, he could speak with some voice of authority. He was a great guy. Do you really know that? Do you know what? If you will make time for the Lord, he'll give you more than two words. He will come and abode with you. I just wished I was more fruitful in my spiritual life. Except the vine abide. There will be no fruit. How ridiculous is that? Who in here could cut a branch off a peach tree and throw it on the ground and come back six weeks looking for peaches? Is that ignorant or what? Is that ignorant or what? Say it, Randy, it's ignorant. That's pretty, because we know. We don't have to be a horticulturist. We don't have to go to college for agriculture to know this. We can just obviously know because that branch has been severed from the trunk of the tree. It's not going to bear fruit. And some of you have not connected with the presence of the Lord in a long time. And you're wondering why you don't have a victorious daily existence. Could it be you need to get reconnected to the tree? Is it that God is unwilling? Is it that God is unavailable? Is it that God is unable? It's me. The enemy of being what you need to be is being too busy. Too busy. Who knows that pastor loves people? Some people look at knocking doors as punishment. Those are the ones who usually don't show up on visitation day. If I get one amen on that. <clears throat> okay. Who in here will admit it's not your favorite thing to do to go talk to total strangers? No shame in that. It's just not how you're wired. We appreciate that about you. And yesterday, Sister Williams was driving the van and dropping us off in various locations. And I went into one stairwell, and it was a family, and they were loading a U-Haul, and they had way too much stuff for the size U-Haul they had. I said, oh, guys, I'm so sorry. Just miserable having to move. I am so sorry for you. I wish this were I could help you. I even said, do you have one heavy thing that you think by me staying a few minutes to help you, it'd make a difference? Oh, I can't. 
took we get off of that and I said, it's the Holy Ghost within the flesh. I do not want to do it. I, I, I told him that. Hey, just that you offer means a lot. They had a little boy, about two, two and a half. He was on grandma's hip. He was just bawling because mom and dad wasn't giving any attention. And so I called Sister Williams. Do you remember this, Sister Williams? I said, could you bring some Cracker Jacks? We've got a little boy who's tore up, and he could use a little sugar pick-me-up. She brought him over to me, and I ran back up. And the grandma said, I can't believe that you would take time to bring this little kid you've never met before to me. And I said, when you love people, you love them in all shapes, ages, colors, and sizes. And the husband said, well, we're, we're moving out of state. You know, there's going to be no benefit for your church. And I said, I'm not worried about you or who's watching me. It's because he's watching me. Do you know what they asked me to do before they let me go? Would you pray for my husband? Do not tell me that God is not dealing with a lost and dying world. They are hungry for what you have. But if they're hungry for what you have, you better have If they're in the valley of indecision and they need the miraculous to happen and your prayer starts out with, now I lay me down to sleep. Takes you 30 minutes to get in the spirit. You're going to lose them people. I love to fish, but I don't wait 30 minutes after that cork goes under to set that hook. I got to be instant, in season. Pastor, you're rambling. I'm making a point tonight. Just as sure as we wanted Robbie to receive his sight, just as sure as we want to see Vicki see the miraculous happen in her life, tonight I am saying there are too many of your family members lost that I'm not willing to accept the status quo. What if we took the same urgency to God in prayer about the lost as we do the dying? I want you to stand tonight. How depressing would it be if God was calling you to do something that he did not empower you to do? But he said, I have called you to be my disciples. I have called you to go to the highways and the hedges. I have called you to go out and take dominion, cast out devils, pray the prayer of faith. See the sick recover, the blinded eyes open, that souls would be saved. God is not calling you in the commission of being his disciple that he doesn't simultaneously empower you to be able to do the job. Any honest people here tonight saying, I haven't been as impassioned about souls as I ought to be? Michael, it tickled my heart the night you received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Just a couple years ago, I didn't even know you. I didn't know you. Angie, I now can't imagine going to heaven without Michael. Can I ask a question? How many more Michaels are out there just looking for somebody? I'm just asking. Little Haley, she's little to me. She's in her early 20s. She received the baptism of the Holy Ghost this morning. She wants to get baptized in Jesus' name. Convictions already called her to consider changing her job and who she runs with. It ain't pastor giving her a list. It's the Holy Ghost drawing her. I didn't know Haley a month ago. Now I can't imagine going to heaven without Haley. Who can you imagine being saved tonight? This altar is open. I'm going to ask you. I'm not giving you a track. I'm not giving you a slideshow. I'm giving you an opportunity tonight. Would you come with passion? With the urgency of seeing cancer eradicated, blinded eyes open, that same passion for the lost. Church's prayer time.